As the COVID-19 pandemic swept across the world in 2020, the Middle East and North Africa region was already dealing with multiple conflicts and intra-regional turmoil. Similar to a virus, another force has been sweeping through MENA meddling in the affairs of neighboring states, as it appears the UAE and its crafty soft power tactics have been a shadowy factor in numerous disputes and diplomatic tensions. Now, Ten years after the Arab Spring protests that sparked a domino effect of social unrest and opposition towards long-held power structures, many are wondering where the dust will settle. In this perfect storm of socio-political factors along with the ongoing pandemic, the UAE seemingly has been able to take advantage of the chaos and vulnerabilities to further its aims of becoming a prominent ally to the West and a dominant regional player. Here are a few ways. Over the last decade, the UAE has become a powerful force in Washington, D.C. In July of 2021, real estate investor Thomas Barrick was indicted on charges of conspiring to influence U.S. policy on behalf of the UAE. According to the indictment, Thomas Barrick worked with UAE national Rashid Sultan Rashid al-Malik al-Shahi, who he referred to as the UAE's secret weapon, to promote the Emirati foreign policy in the U.S. During the Trump presidential campaign, UAE Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed reportedly sent a message to Donald Trump Jr. that he and Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman were keen to help Trump win the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Such eager support seemingly helped establish strong ties between the UAE and the Trump administration. Trump eventually signed off on a 23 billion arms sale to the UAE just months before leaving office which included armed drones and advanced F-35 fighter jets. Five of his 10 presidential vetoes were reportedly related to issues of concern to the UAE and Saudi Arabia. And he overruled Congress's attempt to end U.S. military involvement in the Saudi-UAE war in Yemen. In February of 2021, Sasa Post published a report which reviewed 766 documents relating to the UAE from the U.S. Department of Justice's database. The files show that since 2011, the Emirati lobby, which are corporations and individuals seeking to advance UAE interests in the U.S., have spent over $132 million in disclosed payments for such efforts. The UAE has now become the largest lobbying spender in Washington, D.C., among Middle Eastern countries. According to the New York Times, the 2019 foreign investigation of Barrick revealed that between Trump's Republican nomination in July of 2016 and June of 2019, Colony Capital, a real estate investment company headed by Barrick, received about $1.5 billion in transactions from the UAE and Saudi Arabia. This included $474 million in investments from sovereign wealth funds controlled by the UAE and Saudi governments. The UAE has taken a more assertive military stance in recent years, overtly taking sides in the region's civil wars. In Libya, it has backed ex-General Khalifa Haftar against the internationally recognized government in Tripoli, Reports have even come out that the UAE tricked Sudanese mercenaries into fighting in Libya on the side of Haftar. In Yemen, the UAE has been a key member of the Saudi-led coalition that intervened militarily in 2015, which has led to the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. It has also backed the separatist Southern Transitional Council, creating further discord in the war-torn nation. According to sources, the UAE has quietly worked to set up air and naval bases in Eritrea and Somaliland. In the last 10 years, the Emirati Federation has provided military training and education to numerous entities in the Middle East, Africa, and Western Asia, including the Afghan elite forces, Niger, Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, and Mauritania. The UAE has established military credibility with Western countries through its participation in international peacekeeping missions sanctioned by international law since the 1990s. In 2015, 
The New York Times reported that leaked audio recordings of senior Egyptian officials suggested that during Mohamed Morsi's term as the first ever democratically elected president of Egypt, the UAE gave the Egyptian defense ministry money for a protest campaign against him. The unauthenticated recordings seem to indicate that the UAE backed the Egyptian military in inciting protest against Morsi in June of 2013. In 2019, Middle East Monitor published findings of a report by the Cairo Criminal Court, which revealed the UAE and its embassy in Cairo were funding criminal projects whose purpose was to create chaos and assault police forces during Morsi's term. In January of 2011, Oman reportedly said via its state news agency that it had uncovered a UAE spy network which targeted its government and military. Security services uncovered a spy network belonging to the state security apparatus of the United Arab Emirates, targeting the ruling regime in Oman and the way its government and military work, the agency said, quoting a security source. The spies were suspected of wanting to find out the succession of Oman Sultan Qaboos, who was still alive at the time. Others suggested the alleged spy ring could be related to regional politics, particularly Oman-Iran relations, due to their long-standing ties in security and military cooperation, which the UAE apparently saw as a threat. In June of 2020, the UAE-backed separatist Southern Transitional Council seized control of Yemen's remote island of Socotra and brought down the local authorities. Since then, there's been a lack of transparency regarding the UAE's function on the island. Although Emirati media outlets have presented its actions as humanitarian, many analysts wonder if the narrative is being used to conceal the UAE's expansionist aims. In 2017, four states known as the Quartet, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, and Bahrain, issued a blockade against Qatar with a list of 13 demands that needed to be met in order to restore ties. This led to the diplomatic and economic fallout known as the Gulf Crisis. The Quartet had accused Qatar of supporting terrorist elements in the region and Iran, which turned out to be false accusations. Qatar responded by diversifying its economy and taking a hardline stance on Gulf states' human rights issues via its powerful media platform Al Jazeera. Tensions began to ease in late 2020, and Saudi Arabia's Foreign Minister Faisal bin Farhan al-Saad announced at the GCC summit on January 21st that full diplomatic ties had been restored with Qatar, despite none of the quartet's original 13 demands having been met. Many analysts have suspected this would not fare well with the UAE, who would prefer to keep Qatar isolated in hopes to better its potential to become a regional power. In November of 2020, the UAE stopped issuing work and tourist visas to 13 mostly Muslim-majority countries, including Afghanistan, Algeria, Iran, Iraq, Kenya, Lebanon, Libya, Pakistan, Somalia, Syria, Tunisia, Turkey, and Yemen. Citizens of countries such as Lebanon, Iran, and Pakistan have traveled to the Emirates in large numbers for decades to seek job opportunities, which has aided in the development of the UAE. Some observers believe the ban was related to legitimate health concerns amid the COVID-19 pandemic, while others saw the move as a security measure to ensure the Gulf state appeared to be stable in the eyes of Western powers. The UAE has continuously undermined the interests of Muslims around the world. The UAE has supported China's Muslim concentration camps in Xinjiang. In August of 2019, the UAE joined 37 mostly Middle Eastern and African nations in signing an open letter that praised China for the camps, inaccurately referring to them as vocational training camps. And despite the Indian military carrying out numerous human rights abuses in Muslim-majority Kashmir, the UAE has become India's largest Arab Gulf partner, with Indian investments in the UAE totaling over $55 billion. In 2020, India's Hindu nationalist government sanctioned anti-Muslim riots that left more than 50 Muslims dead. In the wake of the violence, the UAE's English newspaper, Gulf News, downplayed Prime Minister Modi's role in an op-ed titled Stop Blaming Modi for Delhi Riots and All Things Evil in India.
residents of East Jerusalem have alleged that Israeli settler organizations are using Palestinians as middlemen to illegally buy properties in Palestinian areas. Mohammed Dahlan, a Palestinian who interestingly works in the UAE as a special advisor for Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed, was named as being involved in the scheme. This suggests that other high-ranking UAE officials may be involved. Dahlan was also allegedly a key figure behind the UAE-Israeli normalization deal. In August of 2020, the UAE and Israel reached a U.S.-brokered agreement known as the Abraham Accords to normalize ties in exchange for Israel suspending its West Bank annexation. The move was criticized as a tactic that undermined the Palestinian cause in order for the UAE to create business ties with Israel and to gain access to advanced U.S. weapons, including F-35 fighter jets, Reaper drones, and Israeli spying and surveillance technology. Since then, the UAE has been accused of pressuring other Arab and regional nations, Sudan for example, into normalizing ties with Israel, something the Arab world at large is profoundly against. As you reflect on the issues just presented to you, ask yourself, why isn't all the destruction and harm caused by the UAE's role in Yemen's war being focused on in the media? Why are the Houthis only attacking the Saudis when the coalition also includes the UAE? Why would the UAE also back the Southern Separatist Council if the goal is to bring about peace in Yemen? Why is the Palestinian advisor to the UAE's Crown Prince linked to the UAE-Israeli peace agreement? Why would the UAE be spying on its neighbors and backing opposition groups? Why does the UAE lobby so extensively in Washington, D.C.? And how might that affect U.S. foreign policy? And why do you think the UAE is so eager to influence U.S. administrations? And what effect could that have on democracy in the United States?